Now in its 16th year, Campus Safety's Director of the Year program recognizes K-12 higher ed and hospital police chiefs, security directors, emergency managers, or heads of security and public safety who demonstrate outstanding leadership skills, ingenuity, and selflessness. We name the winner for each sector at one of our campus safety conferences. The nomination materials we receive are full of impressive accomplishments and collaborations. We briefly outline these achievements on our website, but wanted to further honor the nominees and their hard work by conducting interviews where they can elaborate on some of these successes. In these interviews, finalists share some of their challenges and subsequent solutions they've implemented. We hope campuses that may be considering similar endeavors find value and guidance in these discussions. One of this year's finalists is Calvin Millar, Manager of Public Safety and Parking Services for William Osler Health System in Ontario. In his role, Millar was charged with creating a hospital workplace violence prevention program. Drawing from personal experiences in both hospital and non-hospital settings, Millar determined prioritizing customer service was the most effective way to mitigate violence. In our interview, Millar elaborates on those experiences plus how he has been able to measure the success of customer-centric service, how his own mental health nursing background helped in creating the violence prevention plan, and additional training opportunities that are offered to his security team. Take a listen. I appreciate you chatting with me further about um, some of the things that were in the nomination. And, um, you know, anyone who's in healthcare knows workplace violence continues to be a, a big issue for healthcare workers. Um, and in your role, you established a prevention model where customer service became the primary focus. And can you just speak to why you so strongly believe in this approach and maybe provide a general overview of, the, of its main priority? Sure, yeah, ab absolutely. It's um, <clears throat> probably about 20, I wanna say about 20 years ago, I started really putting a lot of effort into, into looking at this further. And you know, traditionally any of the training that, that we've done has always, has always been focused on the de-escalation intervention, you know, containment restraint. Um, but we, we've viewed in history the de-escalation as our prevention. And if we're into de-escalation, we're already involved in an incident and we're already progressing either up and down that ladder. And so taking a look at, at not just healthcare, but other industries, what do they, what do, they do? What, um, you know, what different things do I, do I observe from walking into a restaurant or walking into uh, a store? And, and really kind of took a look back um, with that. And customer service seemed to be the, you know, the root cause <laughs> or the root solution to a lot of these things. When you go into a place and you're treated with respect, you're, you, you feel valued, you feel like somebody's caring for you, it's really hard to get upset. And even if you're of that mindset walking, you're, I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to, I'm going to deal with these people and everybody treats you well. It's, it's really hard for you to stay escalated, even if you start walking in that way. Um, it doesn't work for everything. I mean, we're always going to have folks with behavioral health issues, acute episodes. Um, there's a handful of folks that have just a propensity for violence. And, you know, those folks are always going to, always going to be there. So it's not a, it's not a cure-all model, it's a work in progress. And it's, um, it's where we really wanna start embedding uh, our interactions with our staff. Something, you know, when somebody walks in, greeting them, saying hello, instead of finger pointing, using open-handed gestures. Right? When somebody is looking for a place to go, instead of just providing them the directions in buildings that we have so complexly designed, walk them there, right? Or have somebody walk them there if they need extra assistance. Um, so those are the types of things, and part of doing so has helped us to develop rapport, especially with our patients uh, and families that we see multiple times. Uh, we have people with complex medical issues that um, are not going to be involved in our system for a single episode, uh, and having a, a well-established rapport and a positive relationship with those folks um, really helps to, to reduce issues. Um, uh, it's... It's something that's very difficult to measure because how do you measure an incident that didn't occur? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. 
you know, what I'm what I'm looking at kind of for the next steps. And as I said, this has been a, a work in progress and and something that uh, you know our organization is embracing as well on a bit of a larger scale, but something we've been doing um, since our roots. But um, you know, when I when I look at this and I, I view it anecdotally, I can see how the approach is uh, when we have positive staff approaches. And I can also see those approaches when somebody approaches those folks in a negative manner, right? Or in an even in a neutral manner where somebody's just looked at as a number. It's not a negative experience, it's not a positive experience. It's just, okay, you're next. And there isn't that that human connection. Um, so that's that's really where you know we've developed our program. Uh, and you know, looking back, it's you know, very, very personal to me as well. Um you know, we all we all talk about feedback and reviews, and most of us have been involved in 360 reviews where we've talked to you know our leaders, we've talked to folks that work um, with us, uh, you know, and we get that that full approach. And having family and friends in, involved in different um, issues needing the healthcare system has really opened up the other side. What does that feel like? not just from our perspective, but what does that feel like from the perspective when you don't have control, right? When you're relying on everybody else to provide um, for you, for your loved one, you know, where that means. Um, my my best friend and uh, would-be brother-in-law uh, ended up diagnosed with cancer at 30 years of age and, and was in and out of the healthcare system for, for the two years um, that led up to, to, led up to his death. Um, and we were in and out of healthcare a lot, so different hospitals, different organizations. Some of them were amazing and some of them not so much um, and had some really positive experiences. I remember one evening um, we had a lot of family there. Uh, the guard came up and his job was to lock up the uh, rooftop terrace, right? Right beside, um, uh, right beside my friend's room. And he came up to us and said, listen, my job is to lock this up. Are you guys going to be here through the night? Do you want me to leave it open? And really small gesture, but something that meant a lot to all of us. And, and those little moments and those little opportunities that we can give somebody, you know, still fitting within what we're supposed to be doing, really can help shape and make a difference um, to the, uh, you know, to the experience. You may be having a negative experience, but you don't have to have a negative experience around that negative experience. And um, right. so it's those little things. And the other unintended consequence is um, with the Canadian healthcare system anyways, uh, we rely heavily on private donations and funding to, to help us. And you know, the, the unintentional byproduct is when we can create positive experiences for people, they then feel a part of things and, and in turn may decide to become donors and maybe decide to help sponsor the organization, help us to get to that next level. And without them, we're not going to. And it is truly a partnership that we need to establish with our community. And this is where it's led, led me and, and my team to really look at this as how do we do this? And that customer service approach is really that, that start point for us to get, get there. And our goal is never to increase donations. <laughs> that's that's right. the byproduct. Our goal is to become in line with our mission, visions, and values of treating patients and families and, yeah. and really just treating people like human beings. This is kind of a um, little hippy dippy, depending on what you believe in. But I mean, I, I believe in karma. And if you treat people with respect, you'll get it back and it, it yeah. ends up serving you well in the end. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, I still hear people, um, you know, who, uh, who work in healthcare and, and other industries as well say, well, respect it, respect isn't given, it's earned. Right? And that's true to a point, but it's 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 not true when we're here to serve. <laughs> we right. we don't have to wait until that person earns our respect. That should be our default setting. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be creating a welcoming, compassionate, empathetic, respectful workplace, not just for us to work within, but for the people who we want to serve to come and be part of. Right. And now you had said sometimes you can't really necessarily measure incidents that it has stopped because you you wouldn't know for sure. But like since leading with the customer service in mind, are there any results that you can share that show it has helped reduce workplace violence in your hospitals? 
Um, you know, where it's, uh, it's, it's, again, it's very hard to, to measure something that doesn't occur. Right. Um, where we do have measurements is um, our, uh, our patient complaints um, that have, that have come through at different hospitals. Uh, that's a great measuring tool. Uh, one of the things that uh, even when we've had some complaints come through, now, some of them, we've had complaints that are also against our staff, I'm not saying we're perfect, um, but the ones that I, I, I really enjoy, although I still realize that overall globally we've failed, is in a complaint where somebody will take the time to mention how helpful our security uh, officer was and, you know, how the guard helped them to shift, you know, from one place to the next. And, you know, sometimes when we have those, those complaints that come in that have both some negative information, some positive information. It's really nice to see how our department has been able to shape their experience a little bit differently. Yeah, absolutely. And now looking at your nomination, I saw that you have a mental health nursing background and I'm sure this was helpful when establishing a workplace violence program, but how has this served you in other ways in your current role? Yeah, um, thank you. So uh, that's how I started in, in healthcare security is I was actually in nursing school. I popped over to the hospital uh, very selfishly to you know, gain access to the people, the medical library. Um, you know, I've been around before the internet was as robust as it is. So having those, those books were, were really helpful. Um, and you know, working in the, in the healthcare security side and also um, working on, on um, the nursing and I, I graduated as a, a registered practical nurse, uh, did a subspecialty in mental health um, with that. And where I, where I found it most helpful is to be able to have in understanding and empathy for the total picture. And so I understand what, what jobs and functions need to be accomplished from the clinical staff. I understand the jobs and functions that need to be accomplished um, by the security staff. Right? And then the patient is the third part of it. And how does that all interrelate? And looking at processes um, and developing systems within our department that are collaborative and fit within those models as best we can, because we don't want to create a process that's going to be detrimental to the workflow of somebody else. So how can we, how can we develop ourselves to the best of it? And the second part is just that mentorship and training as we have staff coming in talking about uh, the, the different bits when they have questions on how come they did this or how come they might have said this, having a little bit of background to be able to, to answer those on a high level um, to, our, to our staff. And that's been uh, very, very helpful to me over my career uh, is, is to be able to have that um, understanding and the empathy to have walked in that other person's shoes, right? Know what, know what issues um, they're experiencing to some degree and being able to be a supportive support service, which, which we are in the facility. Yeah. People have blind spots in their, in their jobs and you having been in different roles that helps you recognize those areas of improvement yes. as well, which I'm sure has yeah. been very helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing that I noticed in your nomination, it said that you provide additional training opportunities for your team. What types of training do you offer and how do you, ha have you found ways to incentivize people to go undergo these trainings, obviously for ones that aren't mandatory? Right. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. So we do have lots of mandatory training um, in we have a, a contractual service um, that we that we utilize, um, where we've added in a lot of things to complement uh, the um, the organization. So we have uh, things like mental health first aid, um, suicide intervention, uh, customer service, tactile communications, the usual the usual suspects. Our management of aggressive behavior training, um, and. And those are all built in. Uh, we've added some additional training that uh, is, is fairly unique to, to our groups. Um, the International Police Mountain Biking Association, uh, Security Cyclists, we put a bike program together to, get, to cover off um, a wider area and, and more visibility for our, for our folks um, from the spring to fall time. Obviously in Canadian winters, our bike patrol is not running. Uh, so we don't have that. But other things that we've done um, with our team is, is we're big believers in developing people's, people professionally. And most of our people that come to us uh, to be security guards 
are looking for a career in policing, um, corrections, some other some other area. This isn't for for most of the people who come to us. This is not their career, but a step through their career. And so, um, providing opportunities, we set up a symposium uh, and invited some of the uh, other security agencies around us to come. We're we're trying to be uh, very inclusive and open. And I find a lot of people keep things in silos where they want to. You know, uh, hold this and keep their their level just a little bit higher. We want to work together. Uh, and we arranged for the police to provide um, a symposium teaching our security staff things on human trafficking, uh, drugs. Uh, we had a recruiter come in to talk about the recruiting process, which, again, with the with the mentality that uh, we we have, people want to grow, they want to get into those organizations. So creating that value, um, and we offer this. Just we're going to provide the training. And all that we ask for is your time. Uh, and they're coming out uh, voluntarily. Uh, we've set up training on the weekend. A lot of um, the management staff and some of our team leads we've certified as instructors in various programs. Uh, so we'll come out and do workshops over a weekend. So we'll trade our time for their time. Um, grab the auditorium, work on, work on skills that um, have caused some difficulty in you know, maybe the, the restraint skills weren't fantastic with with a with a group. They had a bad call, right? How can we troubleshoot this? Get it get it built in. So we're constantly trying to apply more and more, right? What other tools can we put into somebody's toolbox to make them better? And and by increasing their level of training, increasing their confidence, uh, what we find is there's a reduction in the amount of of force they need to use. There's an increase in their confidence. Um, so there's a definite correlation between that we found between providing those training opportunities, giving people the right tools in the toolbox to apply at the right times um, and build through. So uh, the other piece that we've done with incentivizing is we've created a leveling system. So um, certain train if they complete certain training courses that that we have on the leveling system, they can then start leveling themselves up to another pay rate right that we've that we've had built in. So, uh, there are some programs we have out there that are part of that system, and then we have others that have been added on ad hoc based on you know, what we're seeing, any sort of workplace injuries that have occurred, and right? how do we keep it, people as safe as possible? Uh, and that comes full circle. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, Does your system offer any of these trainings to non-security team members to kind of help everyone gain any of these skills? Yeah, so we have certified a number of our uh, security uh, staff in as management of aggressive behavior instructors, and they co-teach with our clinical staff as well. Uh, we've had, oh, cool. uh, again, just being that support service, being that outreach, we've had people ask us uh, just while the officers are patrolling saying, hey, would you be able to spend a little time with us and talk about X, Y, or Z? And, and by providing that that expertise to the group, they're able to come not just from their own opinion, but from a proper certified program to answer some questions. And um, we have had staff that have just been interested in the training. Um, you know, people's own personal protection comes into mind. You know, for some for some folks themselves, their families, and the other um, the other piece we're we're doing is is going to be offering. We ha we haven't gone to this yet. Um, COVID put a little bit of a hold on it because we couldn't have the groups. But once we can open up to, to full groups again, um, we have some partnerships already in the background where we're going to have folks coming in uh, and teaching um, different pieces to any of our hospital staff that want to come out. So um, things on internet safety, drugs, human trafficking, uh, not just to keep themselves safe, but to keep them fa their families safe and uh, their community safe.